When you're learning Morse code, or CW as we CAMs call it, it's important to do a little every day. That can mean fitting a bit in wherever you happen to be, so having a portable trainer can be a real bonus. I'm just trying out a prototype of K1EL's new Morse tutor board, which is a trainer and so, so much more. Let's take a look at this new kit. If you're learning CW or want a convenient and portable practice set, then I've got just the thing for you. This is the Morse code tutor board from K1EL, a low cost educational Morse code keyer for learning, practicing and using Morse code. Best of all, it comes as a simple kit, so you get to do a little bit of homebrew too. It's a fully contained solution with integrated touchpads to send your CW. It includes Steve's excellent and highly configurable Kia software, so you can be used with your radio to send Morse code, but it also contains a couple of practice modes. Firstly, it can send you random letter groups, or if you want a little bit more interaction, it has a receive and respond practice mode, where the unit sends a character or a string of characters, and you have to send them back. We'll look at these in more detail later in the video. So let's see how this ships, get it built and tested, and then see what it can do. The kit comprises of a couple of dozen parts, all through hole components, no tricky surface mount parts at all, and everything mounts on the PCB, including the rotary encoder and the battery holder. The PCB is through hole tinned and nicely screen printed to clearly show the position of each component. The supporting manual covers both the build and operation of the Morse tutor. This is a prototype unit, so the components you see here may differ in minor ways in the final release. To keep the cost down, this is a bare bones board, so everything you need is either already built into the PCB or will be added directly to the board. The excellent manual walks you through the following construction steps. We start by adding four rubber feet, which will enable the board to sit stably on flat surfaces once the components are added. The kit comes with a 14 pin DIN socket, so you don't have to solder the pick directly to the board. Make sure the little notch is facing the dip paddle and then solder just one of the pins, checking the socket is flush before finishing the job. By the way, my apologies to my American friends for my pronunciation. I think you guys call it solder or solder, uh, where in the UK we pronounce the L solder, but I think you know what I mean. Next, we'll add the passive components, the resistors and capacitors. If you have a component tester like the Peak LCR45, then this will enable you to double check the value of all your components before you install them. This isn't essential, but it can help to ensure your project works first time. Be careful bending the component leads to fit the holes. Make sure you're not bending them too close to the body of the resistors or the capacitors, as this could damage them. When it comes to soldering, these passive components are quite forgiving with the application of heat and, of course, can be oriented either way round. Check each solder joint as you go, using good lighting, and if you have older eyes like me, a magnifying glass. Clip off the excess wire with small side cutters. Your kit may ship with the TO92 or TO18 style transistors. The screen printed position markers on the PCB reflect the black plastic TO92 style and clearly show which way around to orient the transistors. If you have the TO18 style metal transistors, then the tab indicates the emitter. Both these styles will require a little leg bending to fit. Again, be sure to hold the legs with a pair of long nose pliers or similar to take the strain off the transistor body while you gently bend the legs to fit the PCB. The transistor body doesn't need to be flush with the PCB surface. In fact, it's better to leave the legs a little longer to dissipate the heat you're about to apply. Transistors are heat sensitive, so be careful how long you keep the heat applied and give it a little time between soldering each leg to allow that heat to dissipate. Blowing on it probably doesn't do any harm either. The speaker is attached next with the white dot facing into the board. Again, solder one pin and check the body of the speaker is sat flush against the body of the board before soldering the other. You can remove the plastic protecting label at this point. The LED marked as D1 on the PCB should have one leg that's longer than the other, and the body of the LED will likely have one flat edge to its rim on the same side as the shorter leg. That flat edge, or short leg if you prefer, goes closest to the DAR paddle. To provide an on-off switch, the board will be fitted with a two-pin header with a jumper. I recommend adding the plastic jumper before soldering because otherwise it's easy to burn your fingers if you're holding it in place and applying heat. Like the IC socket and speaker, solder one pin and check the pins are flush to the board and upright. 
You may notice that in my build the pins are at 90 degrees, but yours will likely be straight. You may have a second set of jumper pins to install for a switch that allows the keyer to be used with higher voltage key switching radios. If you've been using a low wattage soldering iron to install the components or have a variable temperature iron turned down, then this might be the time to turn it up a bit. The next few components may sink the heat a little, so having a bit more available at the tip of the iron will help make a good connection. Seat the RCA socket flush to the board and apply plenty of heat and solder to make good connections. The rotary encoder should just pop straight onto the board, but watch the pins and the tabs to make sure they're aligned with the holes before seating flush on the board. The two tabs may require a little more solder and heat to bond securely. To fit the three AAA battery holder, you should have some double-sided sticky pads in your kit. Stick these to the battery holder first, and then remove the protective film and stick to the PCB, being careful to align the two pins before sticking the holder down. Now solder those two pins, and you're done with all the soldering. The last step is to fit the PIC chip in the 14-pin IC socket. You may have to lay the IC on its side and press gently against a flat surface to get the pins at 90 degrees to the body of the pick. Make sure that the notch in the end of the pick aligns with the base facing the dip pad and gently seat the pick keeping a close eye on all of the pins to make sure they're all slotting into the holder. And that's it, you're all done. My build took about 30 minutes. Inspect your work closely using a good light and if necessary a magnifying glass. Check the component orientation where relevant and look for poor or dry solder joints or any shorted pads. If it all looks good, remove the jumper from the power header and add three AAA batteries. Once built, there's a quick calibration process to follow. Simply press the encoder button while adding the jumper to the power header. You should hear an AR bar followed by an L. Immediately release the encoder push button. Press the left dip paddle until you hear an R then press the right DAR paddle until you hear an SK bard, followed by an R. Now we're ready to play. The MTB can be used as a fully featured CW keyer to drive your radio. First plug in a lead from your MTB to your radio. You may want to disable the MTB side tone if you're using the one from your radio. To do this, press and hold the encoder button for about two seconds until you hear the letter R. Now send the letter A using the pads. The same sequence can be used to re-enable the MTB side tone. The K1EL Kia is ridiculously configurable and, of course, contains message memories which can be programmed and accessed using the M1 to M3 buttons. If you press those now, you'll hear the letters MT, literally empty. You haven't put anything in them yet. The CW Kia has so many features, it's impossible to cover them all here. I'll do a separate video on that and link it in the comments below. If you're using the MTB as a learning aid, you shouldn't need to change any of the settings for the moment. For now, let's concentrate on using the MTB for practicing. We have two practice modes available. For random groups, press and hold the encoder button for about two seconds until you hear the letter R. Now send the letter G for groups using the pads. The MTB responds with an E, which is your cue to enter what character set you want to use. Enter either one, two, three, or four dits to choose the character set. The MTB will now send random characters in the groups selected in groups of five. Did you forget to set the speed first? Don't panic. You can simply turn the encoder to alter the speed at any time. The MTB will finish the current five character group and then change to the new speed selected. When your brain can't take any more, simply press the encoder push button to end the practice. For more interactive practice, try the receive respond mode. Press and hold the encoder button for about two seconds until you hear the letter R. Now send the letter P using the pads. Again, the MTB responds with an E, which is your cue to enter what character set you want it to use. Again, either enter one, two, three, or four dits to choose the character set. In this mode, the MTB sends a character and you have to send it back. It then repeats the first character and adds another. You respond with both the first and second. It keeps building up the characters until you complete a block of five. If you make a mistake, it sends an X and starts sending a new five character block. 
Using the MTB on your own to practice is cool, but I always recommend having a practice buddy or three to keep you motivated, and this is where the MTB comes into its own. The MTBs can be connected to each other, and when you send, not only do you hear what you're sending on your side tone speaker, but all the MTBs connected also sound out what you sent. This makes a great learning tool for clubs or groups who want to offer CW training in a fun and realistic way. At first power up, the MTB will likely send menu commands at about 10 words per minute. If you're learning characters at a higher speed, that may not work for you. You can set a new character speed for the menu commands by pressing and holding the encoder button for about two seconds until you hear the letter R, then using the command C, followed by a two digit speed that you'd like to use. If you manage to muck up the MTB configuration and can't resolve it, for instance, you accidentally set the menu commands to 30 words per minute, you can restore all the factory settings by simply powering off the MTB, hold both the DIT and DAR pads, and then power on. After about two seconds, release the pads and you should hear a C sent at 10 words per minute for a cold restart. When practicing code groups, the speed of the characters and the length of the gaps between the characters and words are related. If you change the speed using the encoder, both the characters and gaps change. If you want bigger gaps, but to maintain a certain character speed, you can adjust the Farnsworth setting, F. For example, if I want to practice at 18 words per minute character speed, but need huge gaps, I can set the Farnsworth speed to 18 by pressing and holding the encoder button for about two seconds until I hear the letter R, and then using the command F, followed by one and eight. Now when I listen to random character groups, they will always be sent with a character speed of 18 words per minute, but if I change the speed of the encoder, the gaps will get bigger or smaller. Set F to zero to turn this off. The Morse Tutor Board or MTB is designed as a low cost CW training aid with the potential to use it as a serious key or Kia as you get started in the world of CW. There's no option to plug in an external key. That was a design decision to keep cost and complexity to a minimum. You only have to carry the MTB around with you to practice. It's simple and straightforward to build. And once you've memorized a few menu commands, it's straightforward to use. It makes an effective little practice tool that you won't mind throwing in a bag and carrying around with you. But I think its real power is the ability to support group learning with a buddy or in a CW class. Any radio clubs running CW classes should seriously look at these as a great group learning tool. Okay guys, I hope you found this useful. The K1EL Morse Tutor Board is available from Steve, K1EL, and for those of us over here in Europe, from Dennis at Kanga UK. I'll put links in the comments below. So whatever you're doing kids, get out there and enjoy your CW.